أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ثم أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وهو الذي أنشأكم من نفس واحدة فمستقر ومستودع قد فصلنا الآيات لقوم يفقهون صدق الله العلي العظيم عطروا أفواهكم وزينوا مجالسكم بذكر الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse 98 of Surah Al-An'am, he says, And it is he who brought you into being from a single soul, and then has given you a dwelling place and a repository. We have expounded the signs for a people who understand. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many verses in the Holy Quran, he speaks about the creation of the human race. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, He uses an interesting verb when He speaks about the creation of man. Allah uses the word ansha'akum. I'd like to speak about the word ansha'akum before we move forward and discuss this verse. The word ansha'a differs from the word khalaqa. We know that the word khalaqa means to bring something into being. Khalaqa. But the word ansha'a, according to Arab linguists, they say khalaqa means to bring something into existence. And that's all that it means. Something didn't exist and it was brought into existence. It went from adam, non existence. To wujud, alam al wujud. This is khalq. This is the meaning of khalq. But the word ansha'a carries a different meaning. Arab linguists they say ansha'a comes from the word insha', which means al ijad ma'at tarbiya. Ansha'a means to create something but to also undertake its discipline after you bring it into existence. You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He cares for us the way that an owner cares for his possession. Now, brothers and sisters, I want you to think about the last time that you rented a car. Have you ever seen anyone take a rental car to the car wash? I don't think anyone washes a rental car. Why don't you show, why don't you care and take care of a rental as you do to the car that you own? Because it doesn't belong to you. Therefore, you're not, you're not going to show the same level of care to something that you're renting as opposed to something that you own. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala owns us. We belong to Him. So he doesn't only bring us into existence and leave us to ourselves. He takes upon our tarbiyah. So he brings us into existence and he's with us every step of the way. He guides us. He cherishes us. He nurtures us. So ansha'a is a verb that means to bring something into existence and to care for it after it's brought into existence. So it means al-ijad, which means to bring something existent, into existence, ma'at-tarbiyah, that Allah disciplines us 
in addition to bringing us into existence. Allah is the one who brought you into being from a single soul. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, number one, He's reminding all of humanity that you all come from a common source. Whether you're black, whether you're white, no matter what race you belong to, you essentially all belong to the same family. You have the same ancestor. So this verse is a powerful reminder that the prejudice and the racism, not only is it illogical, but there's zero tolerance for racism in the Islamic tradition. Allah, in many verses, reminds us that we all have a common origin. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He brought the human race into existence from a single soul. Now, in order for us to understand this verse, I want to I want to bring your attention to Surah An Nisa, verse number one, where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala again speaks about the creation of the human race from a single source. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in Surah An Nisa, which is the fourth surah of the Quran, in ayah number one. He addresses humankind. He addresses mankind, saying, Ya ayyuhan nas, ittaqu rabbakum. O humanity, be conscious of your Lord. Have taqwa. Who is your Lord? Alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida. He is the one who has created you. He has created all of you from a single being. Wa khalaqa minha Zawjaha. And from that single being, he created its mate, which is a reference to Hawa, Eve. Min nafsin wahida, that single being is Adam. From that single being, the mate of Adam was created, which is Hawa. And then Allah says, Wa betha min huma. Rijalan kathiran wa nisa'a. And from both of them, Allah says, I dispersed the earth with many men and many women. So the verse says, O mankind, O humankind, be conscious of your Lord who created you from a single soul and created from it created from that single soul its mate and dispersed from both of them many men and women now there are there's a difference of opinion regarding the creation of Hawa the creation of Eve now this verse surah an-nisa verse 1 is referring to the creation of Adam and his mate, which is Hawa. And then from both of them, you have the creation of the human race. Now, where does the ambiguity lie? Where does the ambu ambiguity lie? In the statement, وَخَلَقَ مِنْهَا زَوْجَهَا And from that single soul, Allah created its mate. Now, some claim that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Eve from the body of Adam, specifically his left rib. And this is what the Bible says. If you go to the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verses 21 and 23, the creation of Eve is described as she was created from the left rib of Adam So she was literally created from Adam. Now, 
And there are many ahadith, especially in the Sunni tradition, that support this view. That Hawa was created from the body of Adam, specifically the rib of Adam. Another interpretation, which is what is mentioned by Allama al-Tabatabai in Tafsir al-Mizan, he says the word min, the particle min, you know, in the Arabic language we have nouns, we have verbs, and we have particles. We have ism, fi'l, and harf. Min is a harf. He says, Allama al-Tabatabai, he says, when Allah says, وَخَلَقَ مِنْهَا زَوْجَهَا It doesn't mean that Allah created Adam, created Eve from Adam. What it means is He created from His kind a mate for Him. That Eve is created from the same material as Adam However, I would argue that if you look at the verse, there is there are internal clues from the verse that suggest that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Eve from Adam. So let us look at the verse. Now again, there are difference of, differences of opinion. Allah Allah Tabai says. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Eve from Adam, meaning from his kind, not from him literally. But if you look at ayah number one from Surah An-Nisa, there is an internal clue that suggests that Eve and all of the, all the, all the entire human race came from Adam. If you look at the ayah, Allah says, Alladhi خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ نَفْسٍ وَاحِدًا Who is Allah speaking to here? He created you from a single soul, from a single being. You is humankind. This ayah is telling us that all human beings were made from one being, not two. If Hawa was created separately, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should have said, Alladhi khalaqakum min nafsain. He's the one who created you, mankind, from two beings, Adam and Eve. But the ayah says he created you from one being. This is number one. Secondly, we all would agree that Hawa is from the human race. She's a human being. So when Allah says, Alladhi khalaqakum, who created you, it refers to all human beings. If Eve was not created from Adam, it would necessarily mean that she's not part of the human race. Because Allah says, I created the human race from a single being. So if you say that Hawa was not created from Adam, it would mean that you would have to concede that she's, she's not from the human race. Now, so the Quran seems to suggest, and Allah knows best, this is just you know an observation, so the Quran tells us that Eve was created from Adam, but the Quran doesn't go into details about the creation process of Eve. Now, if you look at the ahadith, there are ahadith that do mention Hawa being created from the rib of Adam. But the problem is, many of the ahadith that speak about the creation of Adam and Eve there, the ahadith are Israeliyat. There are many ahadith that have, that have been fabricated, that were inserted in, the, in, the, in Islamic literature from biblical sources. So what we know, and there are contradictory ahadith. 
So what we understand from this verse, and the view of Allama Tabatabai is also a valid view, but it goes against the Zahir of the ayat. So the Quran tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the human race from a single ancestor. And the mate of that single ancestor was created from him as well. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not go into details. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Huwa alladhi wa huwa alladhi ansha'akum min nafsin wahida. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought you into being from a single soul, meaning Adam. All of us are from Adam, even Hawa is from Adam, whether she's directly from his body or she's from the same ingredients that Adam السلام, was created. But the word min seems to just suggest that he's, she's created from him. Allah then says, فَمُسْتَقَرٌ وَمُسْتَوْدَعٌ The word mustaqar means it comes from the word al-qur alif lam qaf dhamma on top of the qaf and ara it comes from the word al-qur which is a synonym of al-bard which means coldness because when something is cold it's it doesn't move usually it's at rest it's stationary so mustaqar became a word that refers to things that do not move that are stable so in this context it refers to a dwelling place mustauda comes from the word wada many of you are probably familiar with wadia it's it's a place where you deposit something it's a repository so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَهُوَ الَّذِي أَنْشَأَكُمْ مِنْ نَفْسٍ وَاحِدًا It is He who brought you into being from a single soul. And then He has given you a dwelling place and a repository. Now, in keeping with the overall theme of life and death, and creation and resurrection some of the commentators of the Quran have theorized that the dwelling place the mustaqar refers to the womb of a female and mustauda the repository is a reference to the grave. This is, I'll give you some of the different opinions on the meaning of mus, uh, mustaqar and mustauda. Now the, the, the interpretation that I'm going to give you now is the interpretation of Az-Zamakhshari, who was a very famous Sunni commentator of the Quran. He says that mustauda is the womb, he says mustaqar, I'm sorry, mustaqar is the womb and mustauda is the grave. So the dwelling place is the womb and the repository is the grave. Now why does he say that? Zamakhshari says that the womb of a female is the physical space in which the soul transitions from Alamul Arwah to Alamul Dunya. So the womb, it's the place, it's the locus for the descent of the Ruh from the spiritual realm to the earthly realm. So the, the womb of the mother is the place when the soul is transferring from one world to another. From Alam al arwah to alam al dunya. He also says mustaqar, mustaqar is the womb, mustaqar 
is the grave. The repository is the grave. Because the grave is also a space of transition for the soul. Because it's the site of resurrection. So you have the womb, which is the, the mustaqab. And the grave is the mustawda. He says the grave is like the womb of the dunya. When the person comes out of the grave, he's in a new world. He's in alam al akhirah. In the same way that when the baby, when the fetus comes out of the womb, he's entering into alam al dunya. When you come out of the grave, you're coming into alam al akhirah. So, Mustaqar and Mustawda are a reference to the points where the soul is transitioning from one world to another. The womb is the transition from Alam al Arwah to Alam al Dunya. And the Mustawda is a reference to the grave, which is the place where the soul is transferring from Alam al Dunya or Alam al Barzakh to Alam al Akhirah on the Day of Judgment. This is one interpretation. A more common interpretation is that the repository, the mustawda, is the, the loins of the male because the sperm cell dwells in the loins of the male. That's where it's resting. And then it is that, that's the, the mustawda. And the mustaqar, the dwelling place, is the womb, where it is deposited and is the dwelling place. Others have said that mustaqar refers to the akhirah, because that is the real dwelling place. And the mustawda, the, mus, the mustawda, the mustaqar is the hereafter, and the mustawda is the dunya. There's a hadith from Abu Basir. And again, some, some scholars flip it. They say the mustawda is the akhira, the mustaqar is the dunya. The point is it's referring to these two phases of human existence. Whether you're talking about the loins of the male or the womb of the female, whether you're talking about the womb and the grave, essentially Allah is saying that I brought you into being from a single soul, and I take you through these important phases in your existence, your earthly phase and your the phase of the hereafter. So this is essentially the journey of the human soul. There's a hadith where Abu Basir, the famous companion and disciple of Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq salawatullahi alayhima, he was curious about the meaning of mustaqar and mustawda in this ayah. So he asks Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, Ya Rasulullah, what is the meaning of this ayah where Allah says, وَهُوَ الَّذِي أَنْشَأَكُمْ مِنْ نَفْسٍ وَاحِدًا فَمُسْتَقَرٌ وَمُسْتَوْدَعٌ The Imam alayhi salam, he asks Abu Basir, ما يقول أهل بلدك الذي أنت فيه إمام الباقر عليه السلام he says what do your people the people in your city say about the meaning of this verse what is the common understanding of this ayah in your in your in your city among your people أبو بصير he says to the Imam يقولون مستقر في الرحم وَمُسْتَوْدَعٌ فِي الصُّلْبِ Abu Basir, he says, people say that mustaqar, the dwelling place, refers to the womb of the mother. And the mustawda', the repository, is a, it means the loins of the male. Interestingly, Imam al-Baqir, alayhi salam, he says, كَذِبُ He says, they're liars. This is not true. He says, Al-Mustaqar, Al-Mustaqar, that which is fixed, is Mastaqar al-Imanu fi qalbihi fala yunza'u minhu abada. 
The Imam alayhi salam, he says mustaqar, which literally means something that is fixed, refers to the Imam of people that is fixed and it will never depart them. There are some people who go throughout this life and they are able to maintain their Imam. From the time they enter dunya, they go through adolescence, they go through middle age, at the end of the life, they're able, they're able to hold on to their faith. It's mustaqar, it's fixed, and that faith doesn't depart. He says, Mustauda, from the word wadi'ah, right? When you when you give something, a wadi'ah is when you place a trust in someone's hands and then you come and you take it back. Imam, he says, Mustauda refers to the Imam that remains with someone for a period of time, but then it is lost, it is taken away from them. And Imam al-Baqir says, and Zubair was one of them. Zubair was one of them. Who was a Zubair? A Zubair ibn al-Awam was one of the notable companions of the Holy Prophet. He was one of the Muhajireen. He was one of the early migrants. He was one of the great war veterans of the early history of Islam. He was a man of faith. He fought alongside Rasulullah in many battles. He was one of the most courageous of the Prophet's companions. After the death of Rasulullah, when everyone paid allegiance to Abu Bakr, Zubair refused to pay allegiance to Abu Bakr. In fact, Zubair was one of the few who responded to the call of Amir al-Mu'mineen and who were willing to fight alongside Amir al-Mu'mineen against the Taghut of their time. So Zubair was with Rasulullah, with Ali ibn Abi Talib. When Amir al-Mu'mineen becomes the Khalifa, guess who fights Amir al-Mu'mineen in the Battle of Jannah? Zubair. Because he had this idea that surely when Ali ibn Abi Talib becomes the Khalifa, he's going to give me a position in his government. When Amir al Mu'mini did not give him any positions in his government, he turned against the Imam. So Imam al Baqir alayhi salam, he says, Allah created us, He created people from a single source. And everyone is born with this fitrah, this recognition of God. Some people, they maintain this faith, it doesn't depart, and there are those who have iman that is mustawda. It's with them and then it departs because of various reasons. And Zubair was one of them. We have another hadith where one of the companions of Imam al-Sadiq salam, he says to the Imam, سألت أبا عبد الله. I asked Imam al-Sadiq. فقلت له جعلت فداك. Oh Imam, may I be ransomed for you. May I be sacrificed for you. This was an expression of love and devotion. He says, إن شيعتك تقول إن الإيمان مستقر ومستودع. This companion says to Imam al-Sadiq, the Ibn Rasulullah, your Shia, your followers say that Iman, that faith is either fixed or it is the type that departs. It's either mustaqar, it remains, it's resilient, or it departs. It's mustawda. The Imam says, yes. This man says to the Imam, فَعَلِّمْنِ شَيْئًا إِذَا أَنَا قُلْتُهُ he says to the Imam, Oh Imam, teach me something that I can say, that I can recite, so my Iman never leaves my heart. That my Iman will become mustaqar, it will be fixed, it will be unshakable. The Imam alayhi salam, he tells him, he gives him a very simple spiritual prescription. He says, Qul, 
في دبر كل صلاة فريضة. Imam he says to him, say the following after every obligatory prayer. Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, and Isha. Imam says, if you recite what I'm going to tell you, you will be able to hold on to your faith. You will secure your faith and your faith will not depart like many people. There are many, they have Iman, but perhaps when they're in their last moments, when they're experiencing Sakaratul Maut, their Iman is shaken. They're, they become susceptible to the waswasa of shaitan. Their iman is weakened. The imam tells him, recite this after every obligatory prayer, after every compulsory prayer. He says, say, رَضِيْتُ بِاللَّهِ رَبَّا I am pleased with Allah as my Lord. وَبِمُحَمَّدٍ نَبِيًّا And I am pleased with Muhammad as my prophet. وَبِالْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا And I am pleased with Islam as my faith. This is important, brothers and sisters. Sometimes we, we obey God's laws, but we don't do it willingly. We're not pleased with Allah's commandments. Make me pleased with you, O Allah. Make me pleased with the example of the Prophet. Make me be pleased with Islam. وَبِالْقُرْآنِ كِتَابًا And make me be pleased with the Qur'an as my book. وَبِالْكَعْبَةِ قِبْلَةً And make me pleased that the Qibl, the Kaaba is my direction. وَبِعَلِيٍ وَلِيًّا وَإِمَامًا And make me pleased with the fact that Ali is my Imam. وَبِالْحَسَنِ وَالْحُسَيْنِ وَالْأَئِمَّةِ And make me pleased that Hassan and Hussein, Imam Zayn al Abidin, that these are all my Imams and my guides whom you have appointed for me as the best moral example for me. Allahumma inni raditu bihim a'immatan. Oh Allah, I am pleased with all of them as my leaders and my Imams. Fardini lahum. Make me pleasing to them. In the same way that I am pleased with them, make them pleased with me. إِنَّكَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Imam al-Sadiq, he says, make it a habit to recite this after every prayer so your iman will be mustaqar, like Salman al-Farisi, like Abu Dhar, like Maqdad, and it will not be mustawda' like Zubair and Talha and these others. And then the ayah ends with قَدْ فَصَّلْنَا الْآيَاتِ لِقَوْمِ يَفْقَهُونَ And we have expounded the signs for those who understand. If you go back to the previous verse where Allah was speaking about the stars, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about this idea that وَهُوَ الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمُ النُّجُومَ لِتَهْتَدُوا بِهَا That Allah has made the stars for you so that you can, find, you can use them as guidance in the darkness of the land and the sea. That ayah ends with what? قَدْ فَصَّلْنَا الْآيَاتِ لِقَوْمٍ يَعْلَمُونَ so verse 97 ends with لِقَوْمِ يَعْلَمُونَ When Allah speaks about the stars. But here Allah ends the ayah with what? قَدْ فَصَّلْنَا الْآيَاتِ لِقَوْمٍ يَفْقَهُونَ Now why does Allah say يَفْقَهُونَ here? And He says يَعْلَمُونَ in the previous verse. The word fiqh in Arabic It means, and this is the definition of Al-Raghib al-Isfahani. Al-Raghib al-Isfahani, he's a Persian scholar who wrote a book where he gives the linguistic meaning of all of the verses, all of the words in the Qur'an. It's a vocabulary book where he defines all of the words in the Qur'an. Mufradatu al-Fad al-Qur'an lil-Raghib al-Isfahani. He says al-Fiqh. Yafqahun means 
التوصل إلى علم غائب بعلم حاضر يفقهون means to know to use observable knowledge to understand the hidden so you use the ظاهر to understand the غائب you use عالم الشهود to understand عالم الغيب you use observable knowledge empirical knowledge to understand the hidden realities whereas يعلمون means to know the observable the stars they are observable entities Allah uses the word يعلمون but when when Allah speaks about the creation of man the human being his reality, especially in alam dunya is not vahil. It's something that's hidden. Because you are a nafs. Your essence is that you're a nafs. You're spiritual. You're a soul. This is why Allah says, هُوَ الَّذِي أَنْشَأَكُمْ مِنْ بَدَنٍ وَاحِدٍ مِنْ جِسْمٍ وَاحِدٍ Or Allah says, مِنْ نَفْسٍ وَاحِدٍ because the soul is a mysterious reality, Allah uses the word yafqahun because the creation of man is something that's mysterious. Even in the scientific community, they can speak to you about the creation of stars, the genesis of stars, but they can't give you very much detail about the origin of life. Because the origin of life is so complex, it's more complex then understanding the stars, Allah says what? يفقهون. You need tafaqqur to understand the mysterious nature of the creation of man. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next verse, ayah number 99, نخرج منه حبا متراكبا ومن النخل من طلعها قنوان دانية وجنات من أعناب والزيتون والرمان مشتبها وغير متشابه انظروا إلى ثمره إذا أثمر وينعه إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ And it is he who sends down rain, sends down water from the sky. And we produce thereby the growth of all things. We produce from it greenery, from which we produce grains in layers. And from the palm trees of its emerging fruit are clusters hanging low. And we produce gardens of grapevines and olives and pomegranates, similar yet varied. Look at each of its fruit when it yields and it's ripening. Indeed, in that are signs for a people who believe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many verses in the Quran, he speaks about sending down rain from the sky. Sending down rain from the sky is repeatedly mentioned in the Quran as a sign of divine power and benevolence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, in Surah An Nahal, Surah 16, verse 65. He says, وَاللَّهُ أَنزَلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً فَأَحْيَا بِهِ الْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that I use the rain to revive the earth when it dies. So through water, through this rain, Allah revives the earth when it dies, when the vegetation dies. This is one of the blessings of rain. In Surah 15, verse 22, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tells us that from the rain, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides drink for human beings. 
فَأَنزَلْنَا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً فَأَسْقَيْنَاكُمُ Allah says, we send down rain from the heavens, from the sky, so that you may drink from it. Rainwater is supposed to be so pure that we drink it. But unfortunately, with the way that human beings pollute the earth, the rainwater has become acid rain. It's in many cases, it's not even drinkable. As, as a Muslim, as a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have an obligation towards the environment. We are the stewards of this earth. Allah says, I send down rain for you to drink, which means that preserve this ni'mah. Do not pollute the atmosphere. Make sure that this rain that I send down is always in a state that you can drink it. It's not toxic. It's not polluted. So Allah mentions rain as being the means through which he revives the earth after it dies. Rain is also mentioned as a drinking source for human beings. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions rain as the source of purification from physical impurity and ritual impurity. In Surah Al-Anfal, Verse 11, Allah says, وَيُنَزِّلُ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً And we send upon you rain. For what reason? One of the reasons is, لِيُطَهِرَكُمْ بِهِ So He can purify you through it. We cleanse our bodies with this water. So not only do we drink it, not only does this water revive the earth and make it green and beautiful for our eyes, Allah says, the water is also for you to cleanse and purify your body. And so you can use it also to ward away the impurities of shaytan, the ritual impurities. The reason why we're able to stand before Allah in worship is because we have this water for ghus, for wudu. So it has... A purification component so in this verse and others rain is specifically cited as the means in this ayah as the means by which diverse crops and fruits come forth from the earth now it's interesting that when you look at the ayah the language of the ayah the verse begins with and it is he who sends down rain from the sky. So Allah speaks about himself in the third, in the distant third person. But then he says, فَأَخْرَجْنَا مِنْهُ خَضْرًا Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we thereby, and we produce thereby the growth of all things. So you see a transition from third person pronoun to first person when Allah speaks about sending down the rain he refers to himself as in the third person but then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the diversity of the crops he refers to himself in the first person and this is an important balance that we have to keep in mind that yes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so great that his majesty transcends this earthly realm. This is conveyed in that third person pronoun, that he's so majestic, he's so distant and transcendent. But at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so near and he is involved in the most detailed processes that we see on earth. He's the one who guides these processes that yield the multitude of fruits and produce that we see. So on the one hand, Allah is that transcendent reality, that unattainable essence. And at the same time, He speaks to us in that first person. He's near. He's ba'id and He's also qareeb at the same time. Now what's interesting, my dear brothers and sisters, is that when you look at this verse, there's a beautiful 
there's a subtle similarity between ayah number 98 and ayah number 99. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about the creation of humanity, the creation of the human race, he mentions that our creation began with singularity. Allah says, I created you from singularity, from a single soul. And then Allah created its mate. So you see, look at the, the, the progression. Singularity, duality, Allah created Adam and Eve. And then from Adam and Eve, you have what? You have multiplicity. So the diversity of mankind comes from singularity. Look at the power of Allah. He can create this great diversity, different colors, different languages from one. Similarly, when Allah speaks about vegetation, you see the same style in the creation. Vegetation all comes from one single source, water. In the same way that the diversity of humanity comes from Adam, comes from singularity. Vegetation in all of its diversity, all of it, everything that grows on the earth, comes from a single source, which is water. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates these plants, plants also are created in pairs, male and female. And then you have this multiplicity. So in the world of man, the story of man is a story that begins with singularity, then duality, then multiplicity. In the plant kingdom, you have the same. You have singularity from water, the common source, duality, then you have multiplicity. So you find that even when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates, there is a consistency in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates. You see that divine signature in the creation of man and also in the plant kingdom. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions grains. He mentions date palms, grapes, olives, pomegranates. And these are examples of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's bountiful provision for human beings on earth. You know, this is, if you think about it, it's really a great blessing and favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us. Allah could have created only one type of nourishment for us. Allah could have just created us in this world, and the only nourishment that we have is one type of food, and that's it. But you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created a wide range of foods for us. A vast variety. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a multitude of foods with different tastes, different colors. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he speaks about these fruits, he says, So he creates a wide variety of food sources for us. He makes them beautiful for us to look at, even the food, the vibrant colors of the food that he has created. Allah could have, he didn't need to create this, this beautiful array of colors in the food. He could have created one color. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the food beautiful for our eyes and delicious on our tongues. Because as we know, we eat with our eyes before our stomachs. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in many cases, He packages the food for us. If you go to the, the supermarket, most of the food is packaged with plastic, things that are toxic, things that if you throw it on the earth, it pollutes the earth. But if you look at most of the food that Allah has created, even the packaging is beautiful. In many cases, it's edible. And even the, the peels of many of the, the fruits and the vegetables that are not edible, at the very least, when you throw it on the earth, 
they're biodegradable. They actually nourish the earth. They give nutrients back to the earth. Anwanun daniyatun. Allah says, fruit clusters hanging low. So when Allah speaks about fruit clusters hanging low, He's highlighting two things. That when I create food source for you, I create it in abundance. Because they're hanging low because it's heavy. A reminder that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided an ample quantity. He has provided us with a sufficient quantity of food. And when they're hanging low, Allah says, telling us also that I've made it abundant and accessible. Because when it gets heavy, it hangs low and the food is accessible for you. Aren't these all blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah, He says, the produce, if you go back to the verse, Allah says, it is this zaytun and this ruman is mushtabihan wa ghayra mutashabihan. It is similar and it's also different. If you look at many of these trees, a lot of them look similar. The trees look similar, but they yield different fruits. Isn't this a miracle? That you have all of these diverse crops with these beautiful, vibrant colors, and its source is a clear liquid. Isn't this a sign of a supreme being who brings these things into existence? If you go to Surah Al Baqarah, verse 25, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He speaks about the people of Jannah, it seems that the people of Jannah, when they're eating the food of paradise, it reminds them of some of the food they were eating in dunya. Allah in ayah number 25 of Surah Al-Baqarah, He says, وَبَشِّرِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Give glad tidings to those who believe and do good deeds. For them, I have prepared gardens through which rivers flow. Kullama, listen to the last part of the ayah. Kullama ruziqu minha min rizqa. Whenever they are given food, whenever they are given sustenance, they will say, this is what Ahlul Jannah are saying. Whenever they eat, they will say, this is similar to what we were given in the past, before. So, this, the fruits that they will eat in paradise, it will resemble the fruits or the vegetables that they were eating in dunya. Some scholars say that they will look similar but the taste will be drastically different. Now it's interesting as a, as a final note that when you look at the Qur'an, specifically when Allah speaks about the food of the people of paradise, there are only three verses that mention meat. The vast majority of the verses that speak about the food that is prepared for Ahlul Jannah they speak about fruits and vegetables. Meat is only mentioned in a few verses. It seems that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is hinting that this is the diet of Ahlul Jannah. You should mirror your diet and have it resemble the people of Jannah because your body was not designed for excessive meat consumption. You can eat you can eat vegetables and fruits raw. Your body is designed to consume these things without even cooking them. But your body is not designed to consume meat without it having cooked. So this, physiologically, your body is designed for the consumption of grains, of fruits and vegetables. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alludes to this. There's a subtle reference to this. When Allah speaks about the food of paradise, most of the verses speak about fruits and vegetables. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us and guide us 
and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Wa akhru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabiyina Muhammad wa ala ahli bayti al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Assalamualaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. So the question is just uh, with two questions actually. One is about, um, and you say that um, being created from a single soul, from one soul, um, it there is no reference to a physical body. Yeah. Then, right. So could it not just be one spiritual, uh, you know, uh, the spiritual aspect rather than the physical? And um, that's one question. And the second was. When you talked about, um, I'm trying to look at this, this uh, making a sentence out of this, and it is he who produced her for one soul uh, at a place of uh, strong faith or you know weak faith. So I'm trying to see how it fits in the ayah. Actually. Okay, thank you so much. Very good questions. To answer the the first question. I think that definitely the word usage is interesting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He didn't say, وَهُوَ الَّذِي أَنْشَأَكُمْ مِنْ رُوحٍ wahida, right? Ruh wasn't mentioned. Neither was jism or badan. Allah didn't say that I created you from one body or one spirit. Now, ruh, so you have ruh and you have the body. Nafs is actually a combination of the two. So you have the spirit and you have the body. The soul only can come into being if there is a body. So when you combined the, the spirit, the ruh, with the body, you have nafs. You have the soul. If the soul becomes more inclined to the needs of the body, it becomes what? Nafsun ammara. If the soul becomes more inclined to the needs of the ruh, it becomes nafsul mutma'inna. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about nafs, it's a reminder that man is not only physical in his reality, he's also spiritual. And he's not only spiritual in his reality, he's a combination of this ruh and this bedan, which is conveyed in the word nafs. This is my humble understanding from, from my research. I could be wrong, but this seems to be the most uh, the most accurate uh, answer that I've come across. And as for the second question, how does you know the idea of established faith and faith that departs relate to the message of the verse? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created the human being to try him. The most important thing for us to maintain in this life is our faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alamu dunya determines our, our eternal abode. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he speaks about the different phases that he puts the human being through. That he takes you from Alamul Arwah to Alamul Dunya. Alamul Dunya is going to determine your eternal life. So your faith needs to be mustaqar for you to be among Ahlul Jannah, not mustawda. And of course, the verse can possibly have, you know, definitely have different layers of, uh, of meaning. And the hadith where the Imam says, the other interpretation is not true. The Imam السلام, could also be, be speaking about the idea that, you know, this is the most important message of the ayah. Maybe the other, the other interpretations 
have a degree of validity, but the most important, the most important understanding is that to understand that mustaqar and mustauda refer to to faith, the consistency and the the resilience of faith, as opposed to having faith that is shaky. Um, Sheikh, I have a question. Um, uh, you explained um, the uh, creation of Eve and, uh, and Adam, no. um, but you also mentioned uh, and, and you explained the different opinions about uh, how Eve was uh, was created. No. Um, but you mentioned that there are not uh, a lot of details about this in Quran. No. Um, that brings up the, the more general question in my mind: that can we say that whenever, wherever Allah is not giving enough details about something, is that does that speak for its uh, insignificance? Um, you know, whenever you it's it's basically scratching on something and and moving on. Is that maybe not very important for us? Can we make that conclusion? We we can't make that conclusion because if 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 you make that conclusion, then then salat then the details of the prayer are not significant. Then then half of the Islamic rituals are out the window. We have to understand that when you have an ayah in the Quran, a general verse in the Quran, and Allah doesn't go into detail, we refer to the hadith literature. If we see discrepancies in the, the hadith literature, which, which is what we see in the case of the creation of Eve, then we have to, we have to reserve judgment and comment. We can't speculate any further. But if we have an ayah where it's a general verse and the specifics are outlined in the traditions of Ahlul Bayt, then, then we use that to, uh, to understand the verse. But it, but it definitely doesn't, just because the Quran doesn't go into details on a topic, by no means is the Quran trying to uh, you know, uh, underscore its insignificance. In fact, what the Quran is doing when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't speak about the details is He's forcing us to build a connection with His Messenger. That's what we need to understand. That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't give us details, He's forcing us to refer to His Rasul and the Ahlul Bayt. He doesn't want us to ever gain a sense of independence from, his, from the guides that He has chosen for us. We should never, you know, you know, develop this, uh, you know, embrace this this ethos of hasbuna uh, kitabullah that the Quran is sufficient. So if the Quran doesn't go into details on a topic, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not significant. There are some cases where, yeah, that is the message. Like for example, when Allah says, "Wa awhayna ila ummi Musa," we revealed to the mother of Musa. Why didn't Allah go into details about her name? Because it's not significant. In this, in this, in that context, details were omitted because it's it's not related to the, the message of the uh, the verse. But in many cases, details Allah doesn't Allah doesn't go into details because He wants us to get the details from the Holy Prophet and the Ahmed Bayt. Shaykh, the reason the reason I'm asking this is. Uh because on uh, on the opposite, um, we you could say um, my understanding is that you could say that if there is something that is repeated over and over again in Quran, and uh, there's a lot of details about something like tohid being repeated a lot and, and ma'at, no. uh, these are these are the very important topics. Yes, um, that was that was basically trying to make the argument that if something is not repeated. Um, but you're saying that this is not what, what, I, what I would say is that if something is repeated in the Quran, for example, taqwa, Allah's commandment for us to be pious, over 200 verses in the Quran, Allah, Allah asks us to be God conscious. So you can conclude, you know, emphasis equals significance, but you cannot say that if something is mentioned once in the Quran, it means that it's not as significant. That's not true. You see, you see what I'm. Uh, you see the point that I'm trying to make. If something is emphasized and repeatedly mentioned, 
you can logically conclude that this is an important topic. But just because something is not mentioned repeatedly doesn't deem it insignificant. Because fasting, there's only one ayah in the Quran where Allah commands us to fast. But if someone says, you know, it's mentioned what just once in the Quran, it's not that important. You can't say that it's not important because it's only mentioned once. Thank you, Shaykh. Ah, sense. Any other questions or comments? Sheikh, have you heard of this uh, hadith that refers to um, there being an Adam that came before Adam? Like there were many Adams before Adam? Yes, yes. There are there are hadith that say that before Adam there were a thousand Adams. There are there's a hadith from Imam Al Baqir alayhi salam where he refers to the you know this these creatures that predated Adam as nisnas. They they were human like. But they were very savage and barbaric in their behavior. So we have a hadith. Perhaps, if if you remind me, I can maybe share the hadith with you, where the imams Ali Musam they speak about this idea of of human like creatures that that were dwelling the earth. And that's why when Allah made the announcement that He was going to instate a vicegerent on earth, the re the reaction of the angels was, "Are you going to create a being that's going to, you know?" Uh, shed blood and cause corruption it's because this was the behavior of these creatures that predated adam yeah it's because i was kind of wondering because that at least to some extent that sounds a a little bit like evolution and i was wondering if this might be like uh because it also even in the verse it doesn't say that like who is the one so we were all created from yeah, so the, 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 the verse doesn't mention, again, the majority of the, the uh, commentators, they, they seem to, uh, to believe uh, that when Allah says, وَهُوَ الَّذِي أَنْشَأَكُمْ مِنْ نَفْسٍ وَاحِدًا This is a reference to, uh, to Adam. This is a reference to Adam. Because, because we don't believe that Adam السلام, had any uh, ancestors. He, he didn't have parents. He was uh, he was brought. We don't know how he was brought into being, but we don't. We do know that he did not have uh, biological parents. So the human race today, we are his offspring. So so if there were human-like creatures that roamed the earth, they must have went it went extinct, or Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, you know, may have kept them, and perhaps they were the ones that. Uh, uh, so, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may have created them, but modern man, the children of Adam, are not from that ancestral line. Yeah, thank you. Ahsan so. I mean, the, 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 the beauty of, of the Quran is that because the Quran doesn't go into these details, I don't see the, the creation story that's mentioned in the Quran to contradict... Uh, the, the theory of, uh, of evolution they're not they're not mutually so believe from a Quranic perspective believing in evolution does not negate creation see in, in the scientific world you're either an evolution evolutionist or you're a creationist in the Islamic tradition they're not seen as contradictory now there may there may be certain aspects of Darwinian evolution that we don't we don't we cannot fully adopt but uh, the the idea of uh, of natural selection and uh, and evolution doesn't seem to contradict uh, uh, the Quranic teachings. Thank you very much, Shaykh. Ah, thank, you. thank you guys so much. Keep me in your du'a, and we will uh, convene inshallah next week. Inshallah, we'll see you then. Thank you.